Hi everyone, my name is Jeffrey Broadwell. Uh, I am GJB at Sonic.net. If you want to ask me some questions after the talk, I'm also JAPHB, J A P H B, on both GitHub and on IRC.libra.chat, which is the IRC home for Raku and Red and Crow and Mugs. Uh, if you want to find out something cool going on in the in the Raku world, that's the place to come. This talk is Retro Cool Raku, which could be subtitled My Journey to the Terminal Namespace. Uh, let's start off with a little bit of history first. Uh, this thing is a TVI Televideo 920C. Uh, it was the first terminal I got to use. It was actually hooked to the computer that ran the annealing ovens, the cooling ovens of a glass factory. It was built by my uncle. He hooked up to one of these. Uh, it had a nice keyboard. It had a relatively nice display. It did all sorts of little tricks. I, I loved it. Um, I had these books to work with. I had basic computer games and more basic computer games. Uh, which were basically collections of games from the mainframe world, mini computer world. Um, you could type them in and play the game. I thought this was the coolest thing. Like, if I wanted to, if I wanted to play a certain game, all I had to do was take the time to type it in. I could save it to disk so I didn't have to do it again. Uh, and then I would be able to play whatever I wanted, which I thought was just this amazing thing. Um, one of the games that I got to play on there was this one, Super Star Trek. Um, it had been modified so many times over the years uh, that it was really long. As you can see, they had to print the listing in a tiny little font. Uh, and that's this is just the first page of quite a few uh, that was necessary to have the listing. Uh, but I typed them all in. I got to play the game. I did save it to disk, yes. Uh, and it was a blast. This is what the gameplay looks like, except on a terminal that didn't have lowercase. The 920 did, but this one was uh, from a, a previous terminal. This is a long-range scan of the galaxy. As you can see, the long-range scan is of a rectangular galaxy, which is not what galaxies normally look like. I suppose it's technically possible, but pretty rare. Uh, but as a little kid, I wanted nothing more than to make a realistic galaxy shape. Uh, so I spent years trying to learn enough about how to program to be able to fix that for real. I eventually managed to get a very crude spiral, but by the time I got far enough to be able to make that change, I was completely hooked. I thought it was the greatest thing. I also, during this time period, got to play some of these. These are Infocom interactive fiction games. Uh, basically, this allowed you to type in English commands and have the thing respond and tell you a story. Respond to everything that you were doing, make an interactive story out of it. Um, here's a look at what the very first of these, uh, from Infocom at least, looked like. This is Zork. Zork was itself based on a previous game called uh, Colossal Cave Adventure. But here you can see what the interface looked like, uh, the opening moves, you know, open the mailbox, take the leaflet, leave the leaflet. I was amazed by this because in just a few K, uh, they had something that could parse an English sentence. I didn't know at the time that they were cheating, but boy, it sure looked like it worked to me. Uh, and it actually worked pretty darn well. There was a lot of things that it just knew. It knew all these different verbs. It knew all the, everything that was around you. It understood when something was lit up and when it was dark. Uh, and all of this was just in a few K and was portable to just about everything that was available at the time. Like every time a new computer came out, it was really quick for them to port it because it was all working on a virtual machine. I also spent some time learning this. This is a logo here showing what looks like the center of a sunflower, perhaps. Uh, which has a very simple command under it that it 
used to run. It's just repeating some circular rotations of the plotter pen uh, and making these repeated circles with a slight deviation of angle between them, and lo and behold, you have this beautiful picture. I thought this was the greatest thing. It's like, oh my god, I can just type in a single line of code and voila, look at what I get. It's pretty darn pretty. Uh, this got me seriously hooked on graphics, and I started doing stuff with other things at the time. I got one of these. This is a TRS-80 color computer. This is the Tandy Radio Shack era. Uh, this is actually the first model, the one with the chiclet keyboard and the gray and silver shell. Uh, I actually had more than one of these because the first one died with literal smoke coming out of it. Uh, but it was a great computer. It did graphics. It did text. It had an assembler for it, uh, which I had. It had uh, games that came with it that were really pretty darn impressive given the what was built inside of it. It has a simple 8-bit processor, but I could play this. This is Dungeons of Diagrath. This is a game that is was so far ahead of its time that a lot of the stuff that it did just as part of the game weren't available for years anywhere else, and sometimes even like a decade before they became normalized. It had real-time lighting, real-time sound, both of which mattered for the gameplay. It had a host of different monsters. It had all sorts of different um, inventory items that you could have, and those mattered for the gameplay. Uh, it had a heartbeat to indicate your health level, so it didn't use numbers. It didn't use graphs or something like that. It just had a thunk, thunk, thunk in the background to tell you how your body was feeling. It had this great vibe of feeling like you were trapped in a dungeon and you had to survive your way out and it was scary people would actually like freak out and have jump scares with it but here's the amazing thing all of that all of that real-time stuff the sound the video the the real-time lighting all that different stuff everything fit in 8k 8k of code and data and that produced all of that five levels of dungeon like i mean it was just a, I think the pinnacle of constrained coding for games, like if you want to see what a game can be that's written in 8K, this is it. They eventually ported this, by the way, years and years later to Linux, uh, but they did it by converting it to C code, and of course it expands a whole bunch, but the original code for the 8-bit processor was just 8K. So after that, I saw this game, this one is Prince of Persia. Here's the, the DOS version uh, because it shows up a little bit cleaner. The original was Apple II, and that's actually the one that I saw when I was a kid. Uh, it just doesn't show up as well on this uh, screen. But it was a perfect example of how you didn't have to animate the entire screen. You didn't have to have a lot of colors. Uh, what you did with it was what mattered, like how you used the pixels that you could control uh, having movements that seemed to make sense as people would sway and drift and flick a sword or jump and try to catch themselves. All of these things were amazing. So it was clear that you didn't have to have amazing graphics. If you took care in how you used the pixels that you had, you could make an amazing game. Over the years, I spent time trying to learn how different games worked. I tried to make graphics. I did all sorts of things where I was playing around with different models. This is a, a Doom level viewer. Um, those of you who are looking really carefully can see the black cracks in the ceiling and floor. Uh, that's actually part of the WAD file format. Um, it took advantage of what is essentially a bug in the base renderer in order to save some space. If you actually display exactly what is in the WAD file, you see these cracks. Anybody who these days is, is using them does seals them up. There's various algorithms for doing so, but at the time I wasn't bothering. So I spent a lot of time practicing graphics and learning stuff. And every time something new came out, every time new shaders existed, every time, you know, a GPU, when that came out and when it could do new things, I wanted to find out about it. This is a portion of 
one of the shelves of graphics books that I have. Uh, I clearly had quite a habit for them. And I just wanted to learn everything there was. And I thought it was the greatest thing. And all the stuff that you could do when you had OpenGL available on the desktop was just amazing. But when you look at some of the stuff that's on here, if you look at the cover of this one, this is showing realistic hair and skin and lighting. This one is showing... Uh, you can barely see it, but it's showing skin doing the right things with uh, red light and green light and stuff. Um, those require a lot of content. They require a team of people who are artists who are preparing all these things and millions of dollars to do something that is really cool. If you see a AAA game, that's not one guy in a garage. That's a lot of people, hundreds of people producing vast amounts of content over years, totally unfriendly to somebody who wanted to just make something cool on their own. So I learned a lot about how to do graphics, but I couldn't do that as my hobby. It just was too expensive and, and required too many people to do it. But these games, the ones that had inspired me in, in my youth, and by the way, that one in the lower right is Robotron 2084, which is a blast on the original arcade cabinet. Uh, you actually have to have the correct joysticks for it, otherwise it's not nearly as fun, but let me tell you, it's a blast. Uh, but each of these things, each of these inspiring games, from Angband to Zork, are the kind of things that I really want to be able to do more of. And they can be done by one person or a couple people working together. It takes a small team. It doesn't take 100 people or 200 people. So... Meanwhile, while I was going through this sort of journey of getting more and more into graphics and then going a little retro, I was also going on a different journey. This one was starting with learning Perl 4. Uh, so this was back in the mid-90s when Perl 4.036 was the standard. Uh, and it's what I initially learned on. Eventually I moved to Perl 5. But... I spent a lot of time with this and, and doing a lot of my programming in Perl. Uh, in fact, this Doom level viewer that I showed you earlier, that was written in Perl. Uh, it's almost impossible to see, but if you look down here in the corner, it says that the uh, frames per second, 272 FPS displaying this. So if you are being told that you know, something like Perl isn't going to be fast enough for games, well... I, I haven't seen a monitor that can do that, or at least, you know, not until just in the last year or so. While I was learning all of this stuff with Perl and eventually getting kind of tired of some of the stuff that Perl didn't do so well and some of the rough edges, this person was starting the, the campaign to, to make Rakuto. Um, not... Rakuto as it is uh, now, but what was in the beginning, Perl 6, was running on something called Pugs. So the path was started as Audrey Tang, this person, was teaching us about OFUN, which is to say optimizing for fun, about radical commit trust, and about how to make a Perl 6 compiler in uh, Haskell. <laughs> And doing it as sort of a study in type systems, because Perl 6, now Raku, has a very interesting type system. And Audrey wanted to understand that. By the way, if you ever get the chance, uh, look this person up. Audrey Tang is a very interesting person with an interesting life. Um, so worth a, worth a look. Uh, in any case, after Pugs, uh, eventually there came Rakudo. Rakudo was a complete rewrite on top of, at the time, the Parrot virtual machine and eventually uh, the MoraVM virtual machine. Uh, but I was really interested in seeing, you know, this was when I was sort of working my way up in the graphics world, and there was getting to be enough in the Rakudo times to start doing some of that graphic stuff in Raku. And so I built OpenGL bindings for the Parrot virtual machine so that you 
could do that from within Raku. I did some little demos. Uh, pretty soon I was doing everything in, in our favorite butterfly. You know, here's an example of one of those demos. This is a stress test uh, of the OpenGL bindings. It's showing a whole bunch of particle effects and some height fields and some texture mapping and some tessellated figures and so on and so forth. It's only getting like 17 frames a second, but you know what? It's actually not that bad, uh, given that it was a stress test and that it was for a very early version of Rakuto. The thing is, nowadays, you can do this. So this is all text. This is what Unicode can give us today. So I can do something without having to have advanced graphics. I can have something that still looks cool, uh, and, but it's using Unicode glyphs, it's using an emoji font, it's using various um, special characters that allow it to look like it's got check boxes and all sorts of different stuff. This is actually a working thing. This is a demo that I did for myself when I was testing out uh, an interface that could be used for uh, simple sort of intuitive uh, character design for role-playing games where it's just like, oh, I want to make it a little bit harder. I want a balanced character. I want them to have some starting skills and boom, it's ready to go. So in order to turn that thing, that little demo into something that you can actually play, I needed to start working on terminal stuff. This is the terminal namespace, right? Aha! This beautiful terminal namespace, which is actually all of these modules. Terminal ANSI color, text mesquitils, which I know doesn't fit the namespace, but it's actually key for some of the later stuff in there, so I'll, I'll explain how it fits in. Quick charts for doing exactly what it sounds like. Uh, terminal print, terminal ANSI parser, line editor, and eventually a widget library. So. The first one here is Terminal ANSI Color. I didn't start this. This was actually uh, Tajik's project. Um, he did the initial version, which worked with the basic uh, ANSI SGR uh, set graphics redemption codes uh, that were standardized back in the old VT days. And so you have a bold, italic, inverse underline. You've got you know basic rainbow of colors. Uh, but it was pretty simple stuff, um, really useful for doing basic stuff, but it didn't have much control over modern color schemes. I knew that terminals can handle more colors than that, so I added support for 256 colors and then eventually 24-bit color. Uh, so now you could do that. Now, like, you had full control of all the colors available on modern, you know, X-Term or, or, you know, terminal. The next piece was text misutils. Uh, this was just a collection of the various utilities that I'd done that kind of helped me to do things like, you know, English stuff and, and layouts and stuff. It's, it's split into two pieces. There's text misutils English, uh, which does things like ordinal names and pluralization and just some basic stuff to make it easier to work with the gross English language. Uh, and, but the key thing here is text misutils layout. This one does duo spacing, wrapping, justifying, columnating. So the duo spacing is, is kind of the key thing, the, the enabler for all of the other stuff. In fact, the line wrapper and the justifier and the columnator and stuff, they are all based on the duo spacing engine, uh, which is relatively simple. It just understands which characters in Unicode are to be drawn narrow and which ones are to be drawn wide. So wide ones are exactly twice as wide as the narrow ones when you're using a so-called monospace font, which is why I call it duo spacing because it's you know two different uh, widths that you can have there. But all of that stuff knows about what Unicode wants to do. It knows a little bit about how Unicode understands context and it allows you to get the, the layout right. So just with uh, Tajik's ANSI color and with uh, text miscutils layout, I could do this. This is um, a, comp 
comparison of different character sheets from a homebrew game system that I invented. Uh, this has a basic guard, a guard sergeant, a guard captain, and it helped me to compare them column by column next to each other to see how power levels worked, whether I was getting the things that I wanted, whether it was too much information, like this particular version of it, I kind of went, I mean, the detail is great for people who like really complex role-playing games, but probably it's a bit too much for somebody who just wants to kind of get going with that intuitive format that I was dealing with earlier. So it allowed me to see what it would be like to create these characters and to, to figure out what power levels would end up being and so on and so forth. So that's a lot of power right there, but that's just sort of a static view. It doesn't show all the things that you might do to have an actual interactive game. Okay, so what's next? Well, here I need to take a little step off to the side because it turns out that in building some of these things, I kind of needed some ability to do charts. I needed to be able to visualize what's going on, like performance data and stuff. Now you can do something like this. This is what you might call asterisk plotting. Uh, it's really easy. You can see there's just a single line of, of code in the REPL uh, doing uh, plotting a function, and it's doing it by just putting spaces with an asterisk at the end and you know, sort of laying it out like that. Problem is, there's not very much in information density here, right? We've only got a few random samples. It's not really clear. It's not you know, pretty either. But it can get you through when you just need a little something. But I wanted to do better. So I started making a chart library. And I started off with stuff like bar charts, um, stack and group and so on and so forth. And, you may not be able to see immediately, but just visible is the fact that this line and this line don't actually match up exactly with the edges of the characters above. That's because I'm using the Unicode eighth uh, block glyphs that allow you to get very much more precise down to a pixel or two of difference uh, between the exactly where the end of the bar charts are so you can get very accurate information. I also needed to be able to look at how the game engine was performing. Like what are the frame times for individual games? And for this, I'm using the eighth uh, blocks vertically rather than the horizontal ones. Uh, and in this case, getting detail down to a millisecond or two. In the frame times that I'm seeing, this happens to be fake data. This is comes from an example, but it gives you an example of what it may look like if you have problems with uh, GC management. So every so often you have a giant GC run, uh, and that will cause these spikes in the frame time. So this allows you to see problems like that, or to see that you know in certain cases you get generally much worse performance, and so you'll see sort of the whole graph rise up for. You know, dozens or hundreds of frames, and then it will settle back down again. But this gave me percentiles. It gave me quick glanceability. Uh, it was really useful. This is for when you have a lot more data than that. Rather than a few dozen frames, you've got hundreds or thousands of data points. You don't know what the total range is. You don't know what your domain is. You don't know how many points you're going to get. You just want to throw the data at it have it make a guess and throw you up a chart. In this case, what you're looking at here is the timings from a, a certain benchmark performance test um, for uh, CSV parsing over time. And as you can see, back in 2017 and into 2018, we were going through a phase of just sort of continuous improvement of the engine and figuring out how to make Rakuto faster uh, in 2019, that sort of settled down, but we needed to get sort of more control so it was more even. We got to a stage where the performance was pretty stable. There was a short period where we lost that stability, uh, and then we got it back, and we got to this sort of bright white-yellow line that's almost perfectly stable performance. It degraded a little bit, got a little bit more variable. People took some time out 
and started speeding the thing up again. And so we ended up getting, you know, setting some records in 2022 in terms of our performance there. But this was all just like, take all this data, throw it at the engine, have it make a smoke chart, and there you go. Okay, that's all static stuff. Now I want to be able to do something a little more interactive. So Terminal Print, which was another project that had been started by somebody else, in this case, Abstract, um, he had created something that was a grid representation of the screen where you could control every cell about what uh, glyphs it contained and what its color attributes were and so on and so forth. So this is really cool. You can you know create some cool looking thing. It's got borders. It's got uh, you know pixels. The the Unicode half code blocks, um, uh, half height blocks, which gives you this ability to make these sort of like super pixels. Uh, that's great and all, but I wanted this. I wanted interactivity. This is actually a real thing. I added animation to the uh, terminal print system and some basic interactivity and the ability to read input codes. Uh, I actually play this on a regular basis. This is one of those little things. It's like there, it's so satisfying being able to play your own Twitch game that you wrote yourself. I mean, yes, it's a clone. It's the classic falling block game, but it just kind of feels good to play the game that you coded yourself uh, and pass the time that way. Now, on a sort of more static scale, or maybe just more for, for beauty, I also used it for this. This is looking into the Mandelbrot sets. You can look at various fractals. You can have bright colors. You can do all that sort of stuff. I cheated a little bit. If you notice up in the corner here, this tiny little thing is the terminal menu. Uh, what I did here is I increased the window size to be gigantic and the font size to be tiny, and that allowed to get me down to almost the pixel level uh, so that I could get a lot more precision in the picture. But that's actually how I do it. When I want to look at, you know, somewhere deep into some fractal, that's how I do it. I, I get the tiny font in the giant window, and I use terminal prints to produce the fractal. So, you know, if you want things that are moving and you want to be able to do animations of like video game effects, you can do that in terminal print as well. I added uh, pixel effects and particle systems. Uh, here you see uh, an expanding wave front and dragon breath and a lightning bolt frozen in action, uh, and a solar beam and an ice cone and uh, an expanding fragmentary uh, explosion. Uh, those numbers in the corner of the explosion and the dragon's breath are the number of currently active particles because it's being simulated in real time as a particle system. Um, with those things, I was able to sort of make a demo of what a role-playing game user interface might look like. So this is actually a real demo that comes with Terminal Print. Uh, it shows you walking around finding a dragon and fighting the dragon. Uh, it's all demoware. There's no real deep engine behind it, but there are a few things that it does, and it does animation, and it does lighting, and, and so on. Actually, it's not too bad, given that it's just demoware. There's inputs available uh, through Terminal Print. This is raw input, so you're actually seeing the bytes that are produced in escape codes representing the cursor keys and so on and so forth. You can have it decode that. Here's a decoded input with getting focus in and getting button presses on the mouse and doing cursor keys and uh, backspace and eventually hitting Q to exit the program. But I wasn't doing it quite right. So I needed to actually do a better job of this because, interestingly enough, even though you can get the input and you can do the output, you can do the animation, they weren't synced together in a way that would allow you to query the terminal. So you couldn't ask it how big it was. You couldn't ask it what uh, colors were available. In order to get that 
variable functionality, I actually had to get the VT protocol correct. I had to build this thing. This is a parser state machine for the VT500 series, but if you're thinking of like VT100, VT220, the 500 was just several generations later, but it is a superset of the others. So if you build this, then you can emulate any of the VT things, at least how they respond to errors, how they respond to control codes, all that sort of stuff. So I implemented this thing in a not terribly big module. It's got a really tiny interface. Uh, the only thing that actually makes the several lines here is that I offer two different variations of the interface. So here you can uh, make an ANSI parser that when it emits an item, it just pushes that item onto an array so that it can be investigated later. And you walk through the input buffer, uh, telling it to parse these things. So you can parse it as code points, uh, UT, uh, Unicode code points, uh, or you can parse it as raw bytes. And the reason for both of those is that the VT spec says that you have to respond to the control codes and escape codes immediately if you are trying to parse the raw byte stream that is actually UTF-8. What you'll get is some of those continuation bytes in the UTF-8 will be read as control codes, and so it will respond by changing state rather than by completing the UTF-8. So you can instead pre-decode the UTF-8 and just send code points in that will properly deal with those uh, and do the right thing. I keep the, the version that has just the raw byte stream around if you want to be able to simulate the exact behavior of pre-Unicode terminals. So once I had that, I could then say, okay, now that I'm parsing this correctly and I can do queries of the terminal and stuff like that, now I can actually build a line editor which is great because what I had available to me before was line noise, and I hate line noise. It doesn't handle Unicode properly. It doesn't handle uh, being in a place different than it expects. It can't handle escape codes uh, embedded in the prompt, which means you can't get color in the prompt. You can't do a colored background. Like It just it had more limitations than I would want, so I wanted to build a better replacement. So here it is. You can see that it's colored. It's properly handling a heart emoji. Uh, it's doing all of the things that I had wanted it to do. Um, you can even use it as the default line editor for uh, Rakuto. Uh, here I've shown an example that it is a scrolling line editor, which means that if you have a very long input string, it just sort of adds markers on one end and the other, indicating that you can scroll this thing uh, and be able to, to handle essentially an infinitely long um, line input uh, without having to scroll the entire screen. So it also handles password masking. It handles all of the usual control codes that you would expect um, to be available to you on any standard uh, terminal interface, any shell. Um, it is built in a set of layers. It starts at the bottom with the editable buffer, which is a role that is necessary for just about any kind of editable buffer. Um, but then it specializes into a single line text buffer. It knows the basics of how to do undo, redo, replace, insert, delete, so on and so forth, all as atomic operations. Um, building up from that, you can say that there are cursors that view into that single line of text. You can say, okay, I've got a text buffer that has several cursors, and when you delete something, the cursors should move appropriately, or when you insert in between two cursors, they should move farther apart. Just doing all the right stuff there. So then you can say, okay, well, I now I want to make a real input field. It's not just a buffer, uh, an abstract. I want to actually have an input field, and I want that to be scrolling. And I want it to understand ANSI codes and be able to draw on the screen using an ANSI terminal interface. And then finally, at the top level, I want to have something that is uh, just a basic CLI input. I want to be able to say prompt, 
and get it. Like, I want it to do the thing. Uh, I don't want to have to care about how to do tab completion. I don't want to have to think about how to do undo and redo. I just want it to magically work and be as simple as possible, and that's what you get with the seal on it. So with that, I had an interest in going, okay, like I've got an input widget, essentially, uh, but it only works in a basic CLI, and I've done this work on terminal print, which means I've got full screen TUI stuff. I want to be able to merge these concepts together, and I had some requirements. I wanted it to be low latency, visually smooth updates, things just sort of look like they're doing the right thing uh, faster than the eye can follow, if possible. I wanted it to be live, resizable windows that have automatic constraint-driven layout. So you can say, okay, uh, this thing has to be at least this wide and no more than this tall, and I want you to minimize the amount of space that it's using for this, da da da, and lay out a tree of widgets and have that automatically be laid out uh, and drawn whenever you resize, whenever the screen updates, whenever a widget updates, it just automatically does the thing. I wanted support for forms and graphs and custom widgets, and I wanted it to be easy to understand, a familiar programming model, something that you could make use of uh, without having to, th to like learn an incredibly new way of doing it, and it certainly wasn't the time to invent a new way to do interfaces. So I use basic things like, you know, the, the CSS box model to understand what the shape of things is and how much padding and stuff you've got in them. Uh, I use relatively simple builder semantics. I wanted to make the easy things easy and the hard things possible. So I managed to get the very first version of this out, and I mean 0 .0 0.0.1 um, last month, back in July. Uh, it's really early. It's there but it's really early. And I'm adding stuff to it as I get time. Um, here you can see an example of a form test. It says, you know, you've got some checkboxes, you've got some radio buttons. Yes, they do the right thing. So if you click one, then the other one's undo. Uh, you have the text input. You have a button there that is currently active. That's the show state button where you click on that and it fills a log uh, with information about the current state of the form itself, so you can see which fields are enabled, uh, what their value is, true or false, or the contents of the text field, or whatever. You can see down here that this button is active. That is the show state button, so it's active at the moment that you press it, and it's actually aware of its own activity state. Um, so all of that stuff just kind of does the right thing. And the code to do that isn't all that bad, right? Like you just load terminal widget simple, you declare that you want your form to be a top level, meaning it controls the entire screen. You say, all right, my initial layout for this thing is going to be built with a couple checkboxes, a couple of radio buttons, text input, a node that changes the direction of layout. So in this case, it's saying I want the buttons for show state and click to be next to each other rather than above each other. Um, having the show state when it processes its input, it just calls a show state method locally. Um, the quit button just calls terminal quit because the terminal is in control of the IO. So the terminal object that every top level knows about, every top level knows its terminal. The terminal can say, like, all right, I'm shutting down I.O. now, and that will put the app at cleanly. Um, I can put dividing lines in. I can have a log viewer. I can set styles. All of the stuff is relatively simple. But you can still do interesting stuff with it. In this case, here is a uh, UI that is doing a work log for, like, consultants or lawyers or something like that. In this case, I did a mad scientist. The mad scientist here is about to use the UI to transfer some time from his unsorted field down to his nuclear stink bomb job where he has spent over a week, uh, I mean over three days of time 
just trying to build his nuclear stink bomb. I think we probably should have spent some more time on sharks and lasers, but, you know, what are you going to do? Um, it keeps track of giving you hints uh, based on the state of what you're doing, uh, allows you to enter things into the field, say I'm going to transfer 0.1 hours from here to here. Uh, all this stuff just kind of does the right thing. But here's the cool thing. Here's the interactive version. It's now a little bit nicer looking. It's got the compass rose in the corner. It's got some new status icons, a little cleaner otherwise. It's got an input line. <clears throat> Here is the entry to a new dungeon level. The person's carrying a torch in front of them, so they're casting their own shadow behind them. But of course, if they turn around, they can see everything and will remember what you've already seen. You can walk around. You can even use the compass rose with mouse clicks if you'd like. You can go into another room and you'll see the shadows uh, are cast reasonably um, in behind each one of these blocks as areas that you still can't see yet. Uh, you can look around and using mouse, keyboard, whatever. Uh, you can look at what your characters are holding on to. Here you can see the rogue with just the silent leather and the throwing dagger uh, and hide that. You can say, okay, it's time to enter some commands. So I'm going to do this right now. It's entering commands for anybody in the party. Uh, it's sort of generic stuff, but if you click on an individual one, you'll be able to not only see what they have and what they're capable of, but the input line has changed as well to prompt you that this is going to be active for Fennec or for Galtar. If you close this up again, it goes back to just doing the usual thing. Uh, it's just going to be acting for the entire party. You can say, all right, I want to go back into exploration mode. And now the keyboard and mouse are doing what they had been doing before. You can see that the lighting carries itself into the tunnel and then expands as soon as you get out of the tunnel. It's actually pretty much got all the things that you might want. So. Okay, now what? Well, onward. I've been working for quite a while on a concept called Mugs, multi-user gaming services. Uh, it's got uh, an organization on GitHub, so github.com slash raku dash mugs. Um, it is a system to allow people to play games with each other where they don't have to be using the same kind of user interface. They don't have to be speaking the same language. They don't have to be on the same continent. They don't have to be, basically, like it doesn't matter if you have a disability, it doesn't matter who you are or what you want to do. Two people or multiple people, groups of people can play games together. Now that I have all of this terminal stuff being able to do interactive, why I can add this as one of the user interfaces. So there had been a stub before in Mugs, a stub of what a terminal UI might look like, and it just played that rock falling game and nothing else. Uh, but now I'll be able to make all the games that I want to play available as terminal games as well. And with that, thank you. And have a great day, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And uh, I will talk to you again soon, I hope.